guys hit me up online. But more importantly, there's a lot of information out there. And whether you're using Firm 8 uh, or Firm 8K and DAP or Superfood and some of the other things that are out there, you know, just, just try it. Just try it to see, you know, the results that you're going to get. And you're going to notice that your, your fermentations are going to be a little bit more consistent, you know. Um, I know my buddy John uses a, a, a superfood and um, Super startup and dap, and he makes and he makes great meat, you know. And I know a lot of people use Firm AK and dap and make great meat. I know a lot of people make Firm AO to make good meat. But you know what they all have in common? They're using some kind of nutrients. Mm-hmm. You no, know, it has been do- it, it has been documented so much that you know. The must is low in yang. You know, we know that it's, it's low in nitrogen, and we know that certain yeast requires nitrogen. It's all, as, as, as to quote Ken, it's all about the cell membrane. It's, in, it's all about making sure that cell membrane of that yeast structure is fat and happy. And you need amino acids, you need, you need nitrogen, you need certain elements to do that. And the only way you're going to do that is you're going to have to introduce those things into the must. Once the cell membrane goes in the yeast cell, so does fermentation. That's usually when fermentation breaks down. So you're going to have to invest in putting nutrients in your must. If you don't, you're probably not, you're going to have some off flavors in your meat. And that's, that's what it is. Now, Part two of that is surrounding yourself with friends to tell you that you have all flavors that you need mm-hmm. and not just drinking it and tell you that it's okay. So it's, it's, it's a twofold thing. It is, yeah, because, I mean, there so are the, some, uh, we had talked about, you know, awful meads earlier, but there's some pro-meads out there that went into making mead because they had yes-men friends around them. They were going, dude, this is awesome. Go make this professionally, you know. I'm not that guy, so but don't reach out to not. me. Thank God, yeah. There's, we but need the more thing is, you never. People. The thing is, you never know how your own taste rates. So I, I actually learned a lot when I went uh, on my honeymoon. We went and toured some meaderies, and there was a couple of times when I had some wine and then checked what they said about it. And you know, the ones where I matched, oh my, I actually did taste black pepper and and um, um, grapefruit in that one. And I bought a bottle just because I actually could taste what the heck they were talking about in the review. You know, but that's the thing. It's like, you don't know, you know, there are some people who don't taste certain things and some people who are oversensitive to certain things. So knowing where someone's bias is in how they taste things is also important. But but here's the thing to me, AJ, whether you taste black pepper, pumpkin, pine saw, whatever, just tell the person the truth. Mm. It doesn't make a difference what your, what your sensory is. There's nothing wrong with telling a person, I taste this, I taste this, I taste fusel. Instead of that blanket statement that a lot of people like to give, oh, man, that's great, you know, blah, 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 you know, just your typical me conversation. We're not doing those folks any favor by telling them that it's great. I don't see anything wrong with telling them that I taste pine or black pepper or I taste dark fruit. All I'm doing is giving them a description of the meat. However they yeah. want to take it at that point, that's their problem. And if there's something in it you really like, you point out exactly what it is you really like about it. And if there's something that you don't think works, then you tell them about that too. But the thing is being able to identify it beyond I like it or I don't. And that's Absolutely. where I think visiting a lot of meaderies and tasting a lot of mead is that's where that comes in. But also having a chance to review something with other people so that you can see how your tastes align with other people's tastes as well. Well, that gets me to one of my other pet peeves, which is home brew clubs. And I love I love my home brew club, but you know we, we need to push the home brew clubs more to start focusing on mead. You know, there's only so many damn IPAs we can make, people. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah thank you. Well, At least I'm not the only one saying. We can, I, get, I get shouted down every time I say, "Please stop the IPA madness," and you know. Yeah. You know we can. Or if you're gonna make IPAs, like, at least make real IPAs. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, we we as meat makers need to push the, our local homebrew clubs to d- do more things around meat, so people can understand meat and understand the difference between bad fermentation. Because you know, a lot of people just don't know, and part of it is education, AJ, to where 
because sometimes that person just doesn't feel comfortable saying anything about the meat because they're not as well versed in meat as they are in beer. So, you know, part of our agenda as meat makers is to go out there and say, hey, homebrew club, you know, can we not do one more presentation on IPAs or foreign stouts? And can I come up here and talk about meats and meat, meat all flavors and stuff like that? I, I applaud my club, Arizona uh, Society of Homebrewers, for doing things like that. But the meat makers and other clubs, you know, I'm not saying they don't do it, but do it more to where we can educate the people on the, on the gospel of meat. Because uh, at the end of the day, that truly is my agenda, is to make people more aware of meat and try to get people to drink meat. Yeah, I, that, that's exactly right. I, my uh, My local homebrew club, I've done several times where I've gone and they're mostly beer but they're getting into mead and I'll go I'll go through my collection and I'll pull meads from all over the world and I'll go there and we'll drink all those different meads and rather than take my stuff you know I take stuff from people I know who make amazing mead on the you know that that I've collected in my travels and and we'll open those and taste them and I'll tell them what it is, the style, you know, what they should expect, give them, you know, the basic flavor profiles that you can expect in that particular style, that kind of thing. And then, you know, we have a conversation around that. And so I feel like I'm expanding their knowledge about mead. And then, you know, they always have good questions. I mean, it's a bunch of really great guys. I'm, I'm fortunate to have a good homebrew club locally. But um, it's, you know, it's just you don't see it as much. That's the thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, we just got to do what we can do to keep preaching the gospel of need. Yeah. <laughs> and the more people you can you can do that with, the, the better off it's going to be. I mean, that's... Hey, somebody has to do it. That's why I'm never going pro. Ex yeah, exactly. And... <laughs> same reason. Same reason is like somebody's got to be out there. You and I need to talk offline to where we can combine our uh, superpowers here and, you know... <laughs> Amp each other up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was thrilled when I saw what you were doing, and I'm like, that is so amazing. And, you know, and, and what you did with, you know, providing a venue at the uh, Mead Mixer and, you know, just all the stuff that 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 you've been doing, and you just sort of popped out of nowhere, at least on my radar. I was like, wow, who is this guy? I got to get to know this guy better. He's doing some really cool stuff. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> mm hmm well, I appreciate it. You know, I, I am very humble. Um, I did not expect to win some of the awards that I've, I've won this year, and uh, I'm very humble to buy them. And I thank my friends, John Talkington and Jeremy Volt, and, you know, my club, like, uh, and one of my friends back in Arizona, Dennis Mitchell, for encouraging me to, to, to enter competitions. And, um, you know, it, it, it I've never been a big competition guy, but I see that it's going to help me feather my agenda of pushing me. So, you know, if that's what it takes to, you know, to make people drink more meat and make more people discover more about me, you know, I'll, I'll enter more comps. <laughs> Yeah, so do you have a do you have a favorite yeast or something that you go by all the time or do you experiment and see which yeast goes better with whatever it is you're trying to make at the time? Uh, I'm I'm a very situational yeast maker. I don't uh, user. I don't use the same yeast for for different meads. Uh, uh, if, if it's something fruity, fruity, a tropical tropical fruit nature, I'll use QA uh, twenty three. Um, if it's something dark fruit, like I'm playing with boysenberries or blackberries and stuff like that, I'll try to use uh, RC212. Um, I, I still like 71B for sizers. Um, I, I like D47. Uh, I, I, it is a drama queen, but since I can <laughs> hold temperature, it's not so much of a drama queen for me. But uh, uh, I really love that yeast. Uh, I was... Uh, both my gold medal um, um, oh, maize and were were D forty seven, so um, mm. uh, I, I really like that yeast. Uh, and I think uh, the other one was QA twenty three, and the other one was uh, RC twelve. So you know, I'll mix it up. I don't I don't have a house yeast, and I'll, I'll I'll just keep 
I'll just keep playing around. I'll do a lot of test batches, and uh, and uh, if that yeast seems to go well with that fruit or with that traditional, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll use it. If not, I'll just keep playing around until I find out something that, that does, and uh, I'll go with that. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I do it too. I, I figure out what yeast I want to use based on what I'm making. I tend to end up using um, personally because I don't have temperature control. I end up using um, K1V one 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 six a lot because it doesn't seem to throw off as much gunk when you ferment it too hot. Well, hot 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 is hard to get around. <laughs> we were talking about that uh, offline, you know. It's, it's, it, next year at the Mazer, I'm going to get a T-shirt, and I'm going to say, you know, some stuff just doesn't age out. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Some st- there's a lot of stuff that does, but, yeah, there, there are some things that don't. There's some things that don't. Yeah. No, you, you're, you, you know, so some of the flavors are going to mellow, um, mellow, but, you know, I, I have a lot of meads I could bring to the Mazer that I save just for when I get a little bit too big for my britches, I go pop one of them open and be like, okay, you were not too long ago where you were making this, so you need to just settle back down. And guess what? Some of them are five years old, and they still taste like crap. You know, so... I, yeah, I, I understand they, they, they that. Were, but every were now and then there's one that's anyway. surprisingly good after a long time in storage. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it is, and, and there's a lot of variables that go into play with that, but, you know, some of those meads I made with, uh, you know, D47 at, like, like mm-hmm. 82 degrees, and, like, oh. some, of the, some, of my, some of my crazy experiments that I, that I did, and, uh, yeah, those meads are not going to age out. Maybe <laughs> in another dimension they will age out, but they're terrible, <laughs> and they're always going to be terrible, and, it, and there's nothing that's going to fix those meads, but, yeah, you know that- what? I, I would love to say in 20 years when I taste one of those meads and if I'm still alive and be like, it took 20 years for that mead to age out. But in, in between that time, I could have probably made about 500 different meads while I was waiting on that one to age up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, proper fermentation techniques, that's what saves you aging time. Well, and, and that's Absolutely. When, and, no, those meads, are the, that's when you put baby in the corner, you know, it's just... My my very first one was so hot. Oh my god, the thing was like gasoline when I pitched it. And that was back when I had no idea how to really make meat. I was just going by a recipe I found in a book. But um, I didn't have the heart to throw it out because it was my first one, and I felt like that would be declaring failure. So I smashed it in the basement, which my basement stays at like 68 degrees year round, which is pretty amazing in North Carolina. And uh, the fact that I have a basement at all is pretty amazing in North Carolina, but that's another story. But um, I, I stashed it like in a corner where I store things and then tried to forget that it was there and went on to make more and, and eventually better meads. And um, after about, it took three years, you know, but in the meantime, you know, I was learning and growing and expanding and learning how to, different techniques and stuff. And um, met Ken, but that helped a lot. <laughs> and uh, um, eventually I went back to that and tasted it and it had all of the bad stuff aged out and it had turned into this amazing mead. And one of my, uh, mm. one of my uh, projects this fall, when I get back from my traveling, Cause I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay put for about three and a half, four months while my daughter's on uh, my side of the country for a while, so I can see her. But I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go back and revisit that recipe and make it knowing what I know now and see how it comes out. Yeah, really and, and I would say you know, there's always exceptions to, to 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 anything. You know, so yeah, some of them may age out, but on average, you know, a lot of those meads are are not going to develop. And I, I want to make a clarification, too, that I'm not saying that you can't ferment stuff at a high temperature and it not come out right. Uh, you know, I said earlier that I use English ale yeast uh, at room temperature, and I've made some pretty good meat, uh, uh, session meat that way. But, you know, I, I, I use that yeast because I wanted the fruity esters with the fruit that I was using. So, yeah. so, so meat can be made at room temperature, believe it or not. With you know, mm. well, with, with the right the room with the right 
<laughs> well, all of my meats yeah, have been made at yeah. room temperature, and they're not all bad. I mean, there's some that are stinkers, but most of them are pretty good. <laughs> 